What is up my YouTube family? Welcome back to my channel. If this is your first time here, then it's just welcome to my channel. Now welcome back. Go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed unless your taste level is just lacking, okay? If you don't have good taste, then honestly, I don't know what to say because I can't relate. I've never had that issue. And as for the rest of y'all, welcome. I hope you had a fabulous holiday, a great Thanksgiving. And if you did not celebrate, then I hope you just had a good day, girl. You guys, today's video, it's been requested before. I'm surprised I haven't done Harold Chipman, but I hadn't, so here we are, since we are on the subject of killer caretakers anyway. Last week's video was very eye-opening for me, and apparently for a lot of y'all, because the thing is, most people just blindly trust doctors as if, you know, they can't be crazy like some of us. It was a little bit eye-opening to see that um, those in the medical profession are capable of those kinds of things. Y'all be careful. Look into these doctors because some of them, some of them are not quite right. And speaking of not quite right, doctors, we are going to discuss today Mr. Harold Frederick Shipman. Now, this guy was born into a working class family of devout Methodists on January 14th of 1946 making him a Capricorn. Now he was born in Nottingham, England, the second of three children to Harold Shipman Sr., a truck driver, and Vera, whose job I don't know, but this was a very domineering, overbearing mother. I do know that. Now she instills a sense of superiority in her son from an early age that tainted most of his relationships with other kids his age, his siblings, other kids in the neighborhood at school because he just had this air about him that gives off the impression that he's just better than everyone around him, smarter. Just everything about him is superior to the next person. Now this left him an isolated adolescent with very few friends because nobody wants to be around somebody like that. And he actually, for the most part, does not mind being alone. In school, he is very much a loner and he excels in his schoolwork as well as sports, particularly rugby. He was really good at that. He doesn't really get into trouble in school. He just remains a loner and is content with his little life as he knows it. That is until his little life as he had known it takes a turn for the worse. At age 17, his mother, whom he is extremely close with, very is basically his only friend in the world. She's diagnosed with lung cancer. Fred is devastated by the news, but he remains by her side every step of the way, providing her any type of care that she needs, any assistance that she needs that he's able to give and continues to support her consistently as her condition unfortunately worsens. Once her condition gets to the point where she needs around the clock care. He closely observes how the doctors would administer morphine to ease her pain and suffering. Out of all of the things that he watches them do to make her as comfortable as they possibly can, this is the one thing that really sticks with him. He finds it so fascinating how one second she can be in so much pain and then the next second she is just child on cloud nine. Day after day, Fred will race home every day immediately after school to be by his mother's side. He would get her out of bed, have a cup of tea with her, and just sit and tell her about how his day had gone at school and just pretty much anything that was on his mind. Although it is not the ideal situation or relationship with his mother, it's something that he really cherishes. He is making the best of the situation. Unfortunately though, Vera loses her battle with lung cancer. Not long after she receives her diagnosis, and he is devastated by this loss. She passed away while sitting in a chair, fully dressed and a cup of tea at her side. And although seeing her like that and losing his mother is extremely difficult for him, it also brings him to the realization of what he feels is his purpose in life. To become a doctor and to help people who are in similar situations as Miss Vera. At this point, he shifts his focus to medical school. And after a couple of failed attempts, because um, he didn't get it on the first or second try, okay? He finally is able to gain acceptance into Leeds University Medical School for training just two years after the passing of his mother. Now, by this point, he's still very much a loner, does not have many friends, but he does have a little luck with the ladies, or one lady at least. At the age of 19, he meets his future wife, Primrose, who is 17 at the time, and once she finds out that she is five months pregnant with his child, the two of them decide 
about to just go ahead and tie the knot and get married. Fred takes his studies very seriously and continues his medical training and fast forward to 1974, he is now 28 years old, a husband of course, and now a father of two. He has also joined a medical practice in Yorkshire where he is thriving as a family practitioner. That is until a little receptionist stumbles upon some disturbing entries into the narcotics ledger. The entries show that Dr. Shipman has been prescribing large and infrequent amounts of painkillers in the name of several patients. He had also written numerous prescriptions for the drug on behalf of the medical center, which is not unusual because hospitals and clinics, they often keep certain medications on hand for emergencies and immediate treatment. But the prescribed amounts are excessive. And this is, this is a red flag. She reports her findings and the practice decides to do a little, a little digging and start up a whole investigation to see what exactly is going on here. One of the first things that they find out is that many of these patients had neither required nor received any of this medicine that had been prescribed to them. When they go to Dr. Shipman and ask for an explanation for this, he becomes very hostile, very defensive, because you know what the guilty give, even threatens to quit altogether. The investigation concludes that Dr. Shipman has developed this nasty little habit and is forging these prescriptions in order to be able to supply himself. At this point, his only option, his only chance at salvaging his career is to enter into a drug rehab program, which he agrees to do. And he also is hit with a very small fine for the forgery. After completing the program, he joins the staff at Danny Brook Medical Center, where he portrays himself to the patients as this very hardworking, knowledgeable doctor who values the trust of his patients and just cares so deeply for everyone around him, especially those he provides medical care for. But those who worked with him inside of the hospital, they got to see a very different side of Dr. Shipman. Amongst the staff, he has a reputation of being very arrogant, very rude, and very condescending, and they were not here for any of the things. And while he is not that popular amongst the staff, the patients seem to love and adore him. He provides exceptional care for, for most. A lot of his patients were very loyal to him. They trusted him. They adored him. For a lot of them, Dr. Shipman was it. Like he was the one and the only doctor that they wanted to see. He works at this medical center for 15 years and the staff did not enjoy this 15 years working with Dr. Shipman. He was very condescending. He had a way of making those around him feel very inferior and stupid, which was a word that he often used to describe the people that he did not like. He is confrontational. He is combative. He appeared to get a thrill out of belittling and embarrassing people around him. And for the staff, it was quite odd to see the difference between the Dr. Shipman that they had known and the Dr. Shipman that he portrayed to his patients. The patients loved him, child. They were loyal. They just kept coming back. And in their eyes, Dr. Shipman could do no wrong. In 1993, he opens up his own practice, which does exceptionally well and was a smart move for him. He knew it would be successful because of how loyal his patients were to him. And they do, in fact, follow him to his new private practice. Here he is with his, at the time, oldest and youngest patient. They really admired Dr. Shipman. He was definitely viewed as a pillar of the community. Very, very highly respected. One thing that they particularly liked and appreciated about Dr. Shipman and what made him seem like he really genuinely did care for his patients was the fact that he was still making house calls well beyond the days of, you know, the doctor folding up that little black bag and showing up at your doorstep when you say you got a cold. Most physicians were no longer doing this, but Dr. Shipman, because he cared, you could call him any time of the night, any time of the day, and he would come and see about you. Now, little did any of these people know, their beloved, trustworthy godsend of a physician is secretly killing off his patients one by one and had been doing so for quite some time. It's just nobody had noticed. It was March of 1975 when he had taken the life of his very first victim, a patient of his by the name of Eva Lyons. Just one day shy of her 71st birthday, she had made a house call for Dr. Shipman to come by and check her out because she was not feeling her best. 
When he gets there, he administers a lethal dose of morphine, props her up in a chair fully clothed with a cup of tea at her side. Sound familiar? You see, during the time that he had been forging those prescriptions and hoarding that medicine, it was not just to fuel a nasty little habit that he had developed on his own. He had also been collecting the medicine for a different purpose and still had enough in his possession to take out hundreds of people. His patients are mostly older women who are very vulnerable because they have pre-existing health conditions, most of which live by themselves. And the one thing that they also had in common was the fact that they all loved, adored, and trusted their doctor. It was to the point that even when a lot of his patients began to perish in alarming numbers, they did not question him at all. They remained loyal to him, believing that surely their beloved doctor had done everything in his power and that nature had just called them on home. And due to their ages and declining health, most people did not see it as anything out of the ordinary that they they had, you know, passed on from natural causes, especially because he always had a very plausible explanation as to how they had passed on. Their medical records always supported the cause of death that he had given. However, Dr. Shipman was also altering their medical records to support the cause of death that he had given. He would also recommend that the family cremate their loved ones instead of burying them because he did not want them to be able to be exhumed later on and possibly prove his guilt in the future. Now what he had failed to realize, as smart as he was being a whole doctor and all, was that each alteration that he had made to their medical records is time stamped on his computer. So anybody who gave it a second look and decided to do the math would easily see that these alterations were made after the patient had passed on. But fortunately for him, no one was asking any questions. They just accepted whatever it is that he told them to be true. And so he continues this pattern for nearly 20 years. On March 6th of 1995, Dr. Shipman makes a house call to 81-year-old Marie West, who had been feeling slightly under the weather. A friend of hers had been there looking after her. And as soon as the friend leaves him along with Marie, he administers his little lethal dose and then explains to the friend that unfortunately, Marie had suffered a massive stroke. In July of 1996, 67-year-old Mrs. Turner, who has a relatively complicated and complex medical history, but at the time in which she enlists the services of Dr. Shipman, literally just has a minor cold. He arrives at the home to look after her, but instead injects her as well and rules her death as complications from diabetes. Then there is a 59-year-old Mrs. Lilly who calls for Dr. Shipman to make a house call for her in April of 1997. He goes in to check on her, leaves shortly thereafter. Her neighbor sees him leaving the home and she's like, oh, now my girl having to have a doctor come through. She must not be feeling well. Let me go check on her and see what's going on. Let me make sure she's feeling okay. She don't need me to make, you know, a little chicken noodle soup or anything. When she goes inside the home, she finds her neighbor there deceased. Afterward, he alters her medical records to include heart failure, which she had no pre-existing heart conditions or issues prior to that. Nothing heart-related had ever been mentioned to her or by her to her family. In 1998, nearly 24 years into his his little killing spree. A local undertaker becomes a little bit alarmed and suspicious of the amount of patience that Dr. Shipman is losing. He does a little digging and he finds that Dr. Shipman's death rate is nearly 10 times that of a neighboring practice and therefore raises his concern to the police child. He goes and tells them that they need to look into this because something is not right, especially considering how many of them are passing away in the same manner. Like, it just is too much of a coincidence to be a coincidence. Now, Shia, I wish I could tell you at this point in the story that this is what leads to the end of his little reign of horror, but it is not. The police barely investigate. They agree to do so, but they don't even run a background check on him to see that he had some shady activities in relation to his, his work back in the day. And because the patient's medical records that he presents reflects and supports what he claims their cause of death had to have been, the investigation does not 
find any cause for concern. And they pretty much give this little deadly doctor the green light to keep on killing, which he of course proceeds to do. His next target is 81 year old Kathleen Grundy. She is actually the former mayor of the town. She is relatively healthy, just feeling a little bit under the weather and very much wealthy. She calls upon her trusted doctor who comes through and makes a house call. He injects her and then afterward advises her daughter that an autopsy is not required. He has the cause of death already written up and printed out and had selected the cremation box in an effort to, you know, conceal what he had actually done to her. He actually does not even stop there. You see, Miss Grundy had a lot of money. He forges a will on behalf of his patient, excluding her entire family from her will and adding himself as the sole beneficiary. Just greedy child, just leaving everything to himself. Now, despite him checking off the cremation box, his patient, Kathleen, is actually buried at the request of her daughter. And then afterward, her daughter, Angela, is informed of the changes that have been made to her last will and testament, which excludes the family. Immediately, Angela is like, oh no, something is wrong because my mother would have never excluded her family from the will and left everything to her doctor. Like that doesn't even, child, in what world does that sound right? Now, Miss Angela is also a lawyer who had always handled all of her mother's affairs. So she recognized what was really going on here right away. It's very obvious to her that Dr. Shipman has forged this will himself. And if he did that, he definitely sent Miss Mama's on to the other side so he can go ahead and collect on this insurance money and everything that she had to leave behind. She immediately goes to the police with her suspicions and then has her mother exhumed for testing to see what the real cause of death really was. An alarming amount of morphine is found in Kathleen's muscle tissue and Dr. Shipman is arrested. News spreads like wildfire about this because it's really scandalous. Most people who had lost loved ones that were under his care began to second guess whether or not he had anything to do with their loss as well. Unfortunately though, he was successful in convincing a large number of them to go through with a cremation instead of a burial and so many of them were in no position to get any kind of justice. However, over the next two months, a total of 11 of his prior patients who were buried instead of cremated as he had recommended were able to be exhumed and had also suffered the same fate as Kathleen. During this police investigation, they decide to check his computer to see what he had been up to, anything suspicious. And this is when they realize that false entries have been made to support the fake COD that he had placed on the death certificates after the patient had already died. Now, Dr. Shipman himself, while being questioned, insisted that Kathleen had an addiction to a medication very similar to the one found in her system. And that was the reason behind the excessive amounts that they had found in her muscle tissue. He also tried to present some doctored up notes as evidence of this, but it is quickly determined that just like those alterations made so their medical history, these notes were also conjured up after the victim's passing. They really kicked it up a notch this time with the investigation because they were able to uncover an additional 14 cases where he had administered a little lethal dose of morphine and had altered the records to indicate that the patient was just dying anyway, child. Despite the mounting evidence, he decides to stick to his guns and deny deny and die with the lie, okay? He was not trying to tell the truth at all. He denies all of the accusations against him. He refuses to cooperate with the police in the investigation. He refuses to cooperate with the criminal psychiatrists that were working on the case. And he was real childish because when the police tried to show him pictures of any type of evidence, he would just close his eyes really tight. He would yawn or he would just flat out refuse to look. He would just look somewhere else. Just real childish, real childlike. When they conclude their investigation, unfortunately, they only have enough evidence to charge him with 15 counts of murder. But it is estimated that his kill count is somewhere near 236 with his oldest target being a 93-year-old woman and his youngest being a 41-year-old man. Now, as his trial goes on, 
and progresses, more and more witnesses and families of lost loved ones come forward with the same, like almost identical account of their experience with Dr. Shipman. They all have similar stories of him being very dismissive of their wishes, especially with like the handling of the victim's affairs or the body itself, his reluctance to revive patients once it is very obvious that they are in distress and in need of some type of revival. He would not administer any type of CPR or anything. He would instead pull out a phone and call for emergency medical assistance from like an ambulance, paramedics, you know, the girls that ride up in the wagons. What they did not know at the time was that these calls were not actual calls. He wasn't even talking to anybody. His phone records later revealed that he faked these phone calls and pretended to be calling for help. Meanwhile, the patient is dying. What was most damaging to his whole trial was the evidence presented of his drug hoarding. The same medication that he was sent to rehab for was the exact same medication that he had been administering to his victims. Now, his defense does everything in their power to paint the picture of this loving and dedicated healthcare professional. But his arrogance and his inability to stick to the same story when asked the same questions over and over was very damaging to everything that they were trying to do. Child, they were failing tremendously at winning over the jury. It just wasn't happening. As the news spread about Dr. Shipman and all of his sinister secrets, his wife, Primrose, was in his corner in court every day to support her husband and continue her loyalty to him despite the horrible things that he had obviously been up to and she was always accompanied by one of their four adult children so i believe that they also supported their father in the year 2000 his trial concludes and he is handed a life sentence with the recommendation that he is never to be released from prison ever in his natural life one day shy of his 58th birthday january 13th of 2004 harold frederick shipman takes one final life his own. He is found hanging from a bed sheet inside of his cell. He had actually told his probation officer before he had done it that he had planned on doing it or he was thinking about doing it so that his wife could collect his pension. So right before their little birthday hit, he just decided to go on and pull the plug child. See, they shouldn't have even let her collect on that just because of that fact. One question that he never answered, leaving many to speculate, is the why. Why take these lives? Like, what was the reason? There is an obvious connection to, you know, his mother's demise. And it's pretty obvious because he had left his victims in the same manner in which his mother had been discovered. They had almost always been found fully clothed, propped up in a chair, and most of the time with a little cup of tea nearby. But why though? Like, are you that obsessed with your mother's passing that you are just recreating this horrible moment. Some people speculated that it was this weird and twisted way of avenging his mother's death, but that makes no sense. Like, I just don't understand. Surprisingly, well, it was surprising to me. I don't know if it's going to be surprising to you, but there are people out here who see him as this angel of death or angel of mercy, that he had seen the pain and suffering that his mother had gone through and decided to take out his elderly patients as this misguided way of offering them some compassion and relief. Like, sir, nobody asked you for relief. I called you over here because I had a cough, okay? I was not trying to get to the pearly gates early. It is also so widely speculated that he just simply has a God complex. There was no doubt that he was a good doctor to those he wanted to be a good doctor to and that he knew his medical stuff, but he felt so superior that he simply needed to prove that not only can he save a life, he can also end one or take one as well, that he possessed the power to make that call. And I honestly believe that that's it. Like, I definitely feel like he had this God complex. His mother's situation messed him up. I believe that he definitely did have a God complex, that he got off somehow by deciding whether to take a life or to save a life really sick and twisted if you think about it this wanted to do it all he wanted to save lives take lives start lives i don't know if he was delivering babies so i can't say start lives but you know you get the gist of what i'm talking about i'm sure y'all we're gonna get off the subject of the doctors for now because i don't want y'all afraid to go to the doctor if you get to scratching and burning and itching child i just go see somebody please don't be afraid
But this has been really interesting, especially for me, because typically we blindly trust our caretakers. Like, we don't expect them to be depraved maniacs. And it's like, girl, they can be that too, which is very scary. You are literally blindly trusting a stranger with your life and you don't know what's going on inside of the head of theirs wild do not be afraid to seek medical treatment but definitely do your research that's all i have to say about that fortunately for us there are resources out here where we can you know check the backgrounds and the histories of some of these healthcare professionals to make sure that they ain't out here doing any of the things that we have talked about in the last two true crime videos all right so that pretty much wraps up today's video on the infamous dr shipman if you enjoyed the video if you enjoyed the look please don't leave without giving a thumbs up to the video it is a very free and easy and simple way to support the channel and it means a lot shout out to everybody who has subscribed 166k we are officially on the road to 200,000 and then a million comment down below let me know your thoughts because y'all know i'll be in the comment section discussing all of the things as always i appreciate you so much for spending your time with me and i look forward to seeing you in the next one peace i don't know if the next one is gonna be an urban legend or another fact or fiction i haven't decided Speaking of not quite right, doctors, we are going to discuss today Mr. Harold Frederick. Is his last name? Shit, man. <laughs> Dang, blue. Fast forward to 1974. He is now 24 years. No, he's not 24 which he agrees to do. And he also is hit with a very small fine of like 600 pounds. Why do I feel like that's not the right currency for, for where he is? And a lot of his patient, ugh. hi mommy, bye mommy. However, over the next two months, why are you growling at me girl? However, over the, you wanna tell it? You wanna tell it? However, over the next two months, However, over the next two months, Bella, please, girl, my foundation on my forehead is going to dry, mama. Harold Frederick, girl, what's his name, girl? What was that?